going to be doing physical exams and checkups on all the patients today. So on uh, Nigel, uh, she's one of our newer patients and she has lots of tumors that you can see. So these are the older, more mature, larger tumors. And then over on this leg, you can see different stages of them. Turtles at the Whitney Lab receive patient care for everything from strandings to boat strikes. Some are sick like Nigel. You gotta be quick. So she is currently in the waiting phase where we are trying to feed her, build up her nutritional stores, um, get her healthy enough to undergo surgery. And also uh, we screen them for internal tumors before we start surgery. Nigel, like some other turtles in Florida, face fibropapillomatosis, or FP, a disease that mainly impacts green turtles that can impair their eyesight and mobility in the water. According to NOAA, some studies show a connection between pollution and the disease. It takes the herpes virus, plus several other factors that we don't completely understand, but we know that poor water quality and weakened immune systems um, definitely are a big trigger for it. So with the water being warmer and the water quality along the shoreline, which is where these juvenile greens tend to hang out um, to feed off the seagrass beds, uh, that's what makes them susceptible to it. For an animal that can live to be 100 years old, um, you know, this is like a tiny fragment of their life. Our turtles that we admit as patients are the worst of the worst. They're faced with a whole other host of, of threats. I'm not saying that this disease is a new occurrence, but uh, definitely as oceans are warming, we're seeing sea turtles in, at least, you know, in the northern latitudes, in more northern latitudes than, than we ever have. When you have more turtles moving northward, you get the diseases associated with them more northward. So is it driven by climate change? Absolutely. It's good for humans, it's good for turtles. Erosion and accretion cycle is just a natural thing on beaches, but when you put in a hardened line, um, which in, from the human standpoint, that's their last line of defense before they potentially lose a home, the sand that's all seaward of that oftentimes is removed and you kind of set up this ecological trap where at certain times there's sand, so sea turtles will nest there, but at other times it's completely underwater. I'm on the side of, of turtles, but I'm also on the side of like what makes sense for, you know, the turtles are like the canary in the coal mine. We've got to make some big, tough decisions to, to be able to, all of us, continue to live as close to the ocean as we do. So my job is to take these incredibly powerful laws we have here in the United States and use them to protect our wildlife and plants. Lise Bennett is an attorney for the Center for Biological Diversity. Her work has led her to help in conservation efforts across the state. We are heading to Sawgrass Lake Park. It's a little tiny shred of wildness that's still left here in Pinellas County, and it's a place where we can see gopher tortoises. Even though they are fairly rare and becoming rarer, because they're slow moving and because sometimes they can do okay near built communities, it's a rare species that many of us have actually seen growing up and, and know really well. One of the species that I like to call playfully my client is the gopher tortoise but they are these incredible habitat builders. They dig these deep burrows that are used by more than 350 other kinds of species across the Southeast. And because of that, they're considered keystone species. A keystone species provides the foundation for an ecosystem, according to NOAA, impacting the health of its animal neighbors. If you take that gopher tortoise out, all the other species that rely on it begin to collapse as well. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that gopher tortoises have been in a steep decline for decades now. And they were actually a candidate to be listed as an endangered species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. But just last year, the US Fish and Wildlife Service denied them those protections, despite finding in their own studies that we stand to lose three quarters of the gopher tortoises that are existing now, just in the next few decades. And so we're working to use the best available science that we have and laws to get the agency to reconsider that decision and give the species the protection that it needs. Gopher tortoises loss in numbers is due to habitat loss with massive development, a problem Florida faces. 
the time of writing is the fastest growing state in the country. I was born and raised in Florida, and I think one part of growing up here that really led me into the work I do is seeing all of the places that I loved so much disappear to just rampant, sprawling urban development without really any thought for what we were getting rid of or trading out for these places. And so for me, it's really critical to protect these wild places because without them, we can't protect our biodiversity here. Approaching land use can also deal with climate change. Every species is gonna be affected differently, but overall, we are seeing millions of species that are now threatened with extinction. And for, for the species themselves, it's a travesty because they just deserve to exist. For us, it's a travesty because they support the entire systems that we need to survive. Pollinators are really important to us uh, as humans, and so we need them for a lot of the food that we eat. And a lot of the pollinators that are in decline right now are declining from uh, things like habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, climate change, Gina Hill is a research biologist that also studies the correlation between climate change and animal ecology. Because they are thermoregulating, um, they are very sensitive to temperature changes and other changes from climate change. So what we did is we synthesized research that focused on climate change impacts on butterflies and moths. And we noticed a lot of different reactions and things that uh, butterflies and moths were doing in response to climate change. It, it really becomes this amazing library of all life on the planet that goes back hundreds of years so we can really use collections to understand change over time. It's really trying to kind of solidify all that data and be able to ask big questions about climate change, about land use change, about species traits, um, evolution, um, the list goes on and on. So they're actually shifting their whole range north in response to climate change. And so they're going to areas where it's cooler. But a problem with this is they can actually lose some of their habitat as they're moving more north and they're losing their host plants that they're feeding on and it can really cause a mismatch um, in their range. We're still trying to figure out how all of these different species are contributing to the ecosystem. And unfortunately, a lot of these species may go extinct before we even truly understand how they're contributing to the overall ecosystem over time. All the things that are affecting populations of organisms in general, not just insects, climate change, habitat loss, pollution, you know, all these crazy drivers, but these organisms are amazingly resilient. They're, they're still here despite everything that humanity is throwing at it. So that's cause for optimism. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.